Okay. So, all right, like you said, my name is Michael Schultz. I am a graduating student here at Walter State. Um, this is going to be on the state of Franklin. And the first thing you need to know about the state of Franklin is that it was never a state. Uh, be very careful about that when you hear people talk about the state of Franklin. It was at no point a state. Um, but this is a big part of Tennessee history that you'll talk about if you ever take the class Tennessee history or if you're ever talking about um, Southern, Southern Appalachian history. This is one of the first uh, attempts at an autonomous government outside of the United States government in North America. Um, this was a continuation of the Watauga Association, which you'll talk about more if you go into Tennessee history and stuff like that. So without further ado, we'll get started. How do you spell Watauga? W A. T A U G A. Watauga. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of background. These are three of the most important characters in uh, Franklinite history. So you have uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Sevier, Colonel Isaac Shelby, and John Tipton. Uh, these three gentlemen met at an event called the Battle of Kings Mountain. Um, the Battle of Kings Mountain was a battle in the Revolutionary War in which a bunch of militiamen, essentially, they weren't even organized militiamen. Uh, really, a bunch of militiamen got together and they engaged one of the forces being led by General Cornwallis. Uh, General Cornwallis had sent Major Patrick Ferguson into the Appalachian Mountains. He believed that he could get uh, loyalist support in the south better or more easily than in the north. And he sent Major Patrick Ferguson into the mountains to round up loyalist support. Uh, Major Patrick Ferguson had a weird way of doing that. He would go around saying, essentially, either join the loyalist cause or we're going to burn your house down. And so it was effective for the most part, uh, but one problem was these men who lived on the west side of the Appalachian Mountains were threatened by that. And so they rounded up a bunch of their friends, a bunch of their hard-nosed guys, and they went across the mountains. They became known as the over-the-mountain men because they came over the mountain to fight. Uh, they cornered Major Ferguson at King's Mountain, and they won the battle concisively very quickly. Um, they killed several hundred and they took 700 as prisoners. Um, Major Patrick Ferguson is still buried there and that is at Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Okay. So John Sevier was one of the supreme leaders of that time. He, he really led that force and he g gained a lot of respect and admiration for Kings Mountain. Uh, Isaac Shelby similarly, John Tipton not so much. Uh, he's not a very well known name but he was present there. Uh, one thing that comes into play later is John Sevier and John Tipton hate each other. They absolutely come to hate one another, and that'll be crucial in the state of Franklin. Now, getting across, in October of 1783, um, the North Carolina legislators passed what they called the Land Grab Act, uh, largely pushed forward by William Blunt. This was an act that gave legislators, and well, not necessarily only legislators, but they were the only ones wealthy enough to do it, uh, the ability to purchase land west of the Appalachian Mountains. Now, previous to the Revolutionary War, the British had made laws that said that you couldn't settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. Obviously, the Revolutionary War being over, most of, or all of the British uh, rules were void and nullified now. So they began selling off at auction these lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, four million acres were sold west of the Appalachians. It got to the point where they were auctioning them off at 100 acre tracks. Now, how many of you know very many people that could just up and buy 100 acres at a time? And dozens and dozens of those tracks. Uh, this was for a very small elite few. Uh, ultimately, it became something just for the legislators in North Carolina and um, speculators to build up fortunes for themselves. After that, in April of 1784, so this is just a matter of months after, the North Carolinian legislature passed another act called the Land Session Act. What the Land Session Act did was it took all of the responsibility that North Carolina had to protect and uphold the land west of the Appalachian Mountains and ceded that to the government of America at that point, which was the Articles of Confederation. Okay. One of the reasons that they did this was when they started selling off that land and settlers began pouring over the Appalachian Mountains, they were in danger. There were Native Americans, the French, the Spanish, and they were under attack. North Carolina was responsible for protecting them, so it became a big 
uh, expense for them to allocate money and forces across the Appalachian Mountains to protect those settlers. Okay? So, that was one reason. Another was that there was a lot of pressure coming from the Continental Congress, or as I'm going to call it, that may not be the correct term, but the Articles Confederation government um, to cede the land west of the Appalachian Mountains because there were border claims that were uh, in conflict with one another. For example, the southern border of North Carolina, as I'm going to show you, was in conflict, conflict with the northern border of Georgia. They both claimed to own the same land. The uh, Articles of Confederation leaders wanted that to be done away with so that they could more properly move west and begin their empire. Um, <clears throat> the governor of North Carolina, his name's Alexander Martin, at one point, one of the Native Americans west of the Appalachians, his name was Old Tassel, um, he wrote to Governor Martin and he said, your people are settling on our lands. We don't have anywhere to hunt. They're taking our places of living uh, and they're beginning to threaten us. And we've made pieces with you before. We don't want there to be a war. You need to do something about this. Governor Martin wrote back to him and said, the great council of 13 American states at Philadelphia should transact all affairs belonging to red people. So he was making it abundantly clear, we are not taking responsibility for that anymore. This is in the responsibility of the Articles of Confederation. Because there was no one to really appeal to, there was a convention held in Jonesboro, which was across the Appalachian Mountains, on the 23rd of August in 1784. Now, they elected as the president of this convention John Sevier, because he was the most well-known and well-respected man to appear. The purpose of this convention was so that they could form a coherent government that would, number one, protect the people. They were going to form a militia, but also to uphold some law and order. They had no courts there. They could appeal to no one if you broke a law. They were no longer North Carolinian, but they were under the authority of the Articles of Confederation, which they couldn't really appeal to if anything happened. Uh, because the Articles of Confederation, as a weak governing force, didn't really have the authority to order anything. They could only request it or recommend it. So they held a vote to declare independence from North Carolina as an independent, autonomous entity. At that point, the vote passed 28 to 15. Now, an important thing, John Tipton voted against it. He wanted to remain loyal to North Carolina now you may say at that point, well what do you mean remain loyal to North Carolina? North Carolina had just ceded that land off, they no longer owned it. When the citizens in North Carolina found out that the legislators had enacted the Land Grab Act, which allowed them to buy all that land, and then enacted the Land Cession Act, which made them not responsible for it, they found out that these men had bought all this land and then held no responsibility. So they gave people permission to move in, and then they left them high and dry. One important article in the Land Session Act indicated that even though they had ceded this land to the Articles of, Confe uh, Articles of Confederation leaders, was that the men who had purchased that land through the Land Grab Act maintained ownership of that land. So the responsibility of taking care of it went to the Articles of Confederation. The ownership remained with them. So they were free to speculate the land and then sell it off, doubling, tripling, and making money off of it. Yes? It looks like they knew that the land was going to go to the national government, and let's just call that the Confederation government. The Confederation government. Yeah. It looks like now that they know it's going to go to the Confederation government, it's going to become a new state. These North Carolina men wanted to make sure that they got to hold that land out there so that when it gets sold and made into a new state, right. they would have big chunks of it to themselves. Exactly. Before it goes away. Right. And that seems to be one of the, what they were up to. And ultimately, that's exactly what happened. One of the men that I mentioned, William Blunt, he uh, gained a lot from that. He was actually one of the men that contributed to the Land Session Act, uh, maintaining his ownership of it without responsibility. And later on, he would have vast gains from that. Okay. The people that voted against this and the people that wanted to maintain their loyalty to North Carolina became known as the Tiptonites. Okay. The new legislature that was put in after the North Carolinian citizens found out what they had done, they completely ousted those legislators who had done that because they believed it to be uh, immoral. 
the new legislators repealed the Land Session Act. And they said, no, that, that's our land. We're supposed to be responsible for it. But the um, Jonesboro Convention had already been decided on at that point, And the people across the mountain said, no, you ceded us off. We're responsible for ourselves now. In November of 1785, they met again to form a constitution, and they officially elected John Sevier as their governor. Uh, John Tipton did not like this. Uh, he was very angry about the fact that they made John Sevier governor. A shouting match erupted in the courtroom. Uh, somewhere along the lines, one guy said, let's just go outside and settle it. The other one said, I'd be more than happy to do that. And they went out into the street and fought. And uh, John Sevier beat John Tipton with his cane. <laughs> and so eventually they had to pull them off of one another. And that was the formation of the Constitution of the State of Franklin. Now what I've got here is an example which Dr. McClure has made me aware that this is something that you should have seen before where North Carolina actually owned all of this. Um, when I first showed him this, he asked me, why does that say that they ceded the land in 1790? Well, as I just mentioned to you, they repealed the Session Act of 1784. They took it back. Later in 1790, they ended up ceding it again, and that was the one that held. Okay. This area in gray is the original state of Franklin. That's what they got. That's all they had to work with. Uh, so we sit round about here-ish. That's Hamblin County now. Didn't exist then. But you imagine that being an entire state. That's what they had to work with. But they were adamant about the fact that they wanted to be autonomous. Why do you refer to them as a state? Why do they refer to them as a state if it's not a state? They wanted to be a state, and they fought valiantly to be, uh, to be recognized as a state. Um, I make the clarification that it was never a state because in most books that you're ever going to read they refer to it as the state of Franklin when in fact it was never recognized as one. I will, in talking about it, call it the state of Franklin or that is the state of Franklin, but I did want to make that clarification because even I'm guilty of that. It was never an official state. And when you say that that's what Britain had to work with, uh, you might want to think about in terms of that's as much as they could encroach upon Native Americans at that point in time. At that point. They certainly did, and, and they do. Um, this Declaration of Independence, if you will call it that, uh, as well as the formation of their constitution and the election of a governor and a speaker um, independently, really bothered the governor of North Carolina. He took great offense to this, and he issued a manifesto on the 25th of April, 1785. Uh, it was a direct letter written to John Sevier, but it was meant to be a threat to everyone that had voted for this. Um, very lengthy, I've got a short uh, quote here from it. He's writing to John Sevier and he says, Tarnish not your laurels that you won at King's Mountain and elsewhere in a black and traitorous revolt. So he, he did not take this lightly. He was very serious. This is a black and traitorous revolt. John Sevier wrote back within a month, 14th of May, 1785, um, not in the least bit um, discouraged by it. He says, in answer to the charge, this country was ceded off. Now they knew very well that they had repealed the Session Act, but it was the fact that they had ceded them off and left them hanging in the balance without anyone to protect them. He held on to that. He said, you ceded us off. If Governor Martin is right in his suggestion, we can only say that the Assembly of North Carolina deceived us laying a plan to destroy that part of her citizens, she so often, frankly confessed, saved the parent state from ruin. And that's a call back to the Battle of Kings Mountain. He says, the Battle of Kings Mountain, we came over there and saved you. There's also a, a little cheeky reference there, we so frankly, and they're forming the state of Franklin. Uh, kind of a clever guy there. But they were very, very adamant on both sides. The governor considered this a black and traitorous revolt, Governor John Sevier, as he was called, said, you deceived us if we've done anything wrong. You told us that we were being ceded away. We were no longer yours. So we've done what we had to do to survive. Only two days later, John Sevier sent a petition for statehood to, oh, I didn't update that. This should not read Congress. That should be the uh, Confederate government. He sent a petition for statehood to the Confederation government uh, in the hands of William Cock. He was asking them to admit the state of Franklin as an official state in the Union. Now that was eventually voted on. Surprisingly enough, seven states voted for admission. 
um, of the 13, but they needed a two-thirds majority to actually be admitted, so it didn't, it didn't get put into the Union. The Treaty of Dumplin' Creek, this is the supreme moment for the state of Franklin. Um, this is their shining moment. So, this was organized by the Franklinots on the 31st of May, 1785. Let's get a couple of people in here. Okay. One of the reasons that the Treaty of Dumplin' Creek is criticized for its legitimacy is because of who was there and who wasn't. There were three leaders of the Cherokee Nation. Their names were Old Tassel, Dragging Canoe, and Hanging Maw. And they were the supreme chiefs of the Cherokee Nation. Though they were invited by the government of Franklin, they did not attend. Old Tassel, who was the highest ranking tribe leader, sent Anku of Chota, who was a much younger person. Uh, this may have been an intention to see how he would perform in such an important thing. It may have been him not taking the state of Franklin seriously. Thirty Cherokee representatives did go with Anku of Chota, but Dragon Canoe and Hanging Maw entirely declined to have any part of it. They didn't show up whatsoever, nor did they send anyone in their stead. Uh, reports of the treaty says that uh, the Franklinites wanted to turn the Cherokee into, quote, useful citizens, and that the treaty signing went over in a neighborly and friendly manner. This went well. Uh, John Sevier was present. Many of his um, constituents were with him. This went very well. Uh, what they secured for themselves they called a treaty of amity and perpetual friendship between themselves and the Cherokee. And what this got them, this uh, upper arrow here is where Dumplin' Creek is, and this lower is where they were allowed to settle to. Okay, so this portion of land here is what they were allowed to settle by the Treaty of Dumplin' Creek. And you say, okay, that's still not very much, but in that portion of land is what would become Sevierville, Gatlinburg, Knoxville, and Maryville, which are some of the larger cities in eastern Tennessee uh, today. Even then, they would become very important cities. So this was a big deal. They had actually signed a treaty. Uh, one of the biggest things in this, um, distinguishing yourself as an autonomous state is getting someone else to recognize you when they got the Cherokee Nation to recognize them and sign this treaty. That was a big deal for them. Uh, the, also, the fact that they were able to negotiate a peaceful treaty under neighborly and friendly terms with the Native Americans, that was a big deal. They were very proud of this. Uh, also, keep in mind, this is only two weeks after he had responded to Governor Martin saying, we're not, we're not done here. So he's moving forward. He says, we are not going to dissolve. We're going to continue moving, as Dr. McLaurin indicated. They're going to continue expanding. All right? Now, in response to this, the Confederation government took notice. They came down. They came to Hillsboro, North Carolina. They invited the Native Americans, and two of the three largest, or two of the three most prominent Native American leaders did show up to this one. So this was organized by the Confederation government on the 28th of November, 1785. Old Tassel and Hanging Maw attended. They both came. Dragon Canoe still did not come, but he was actually the leader of the Chickamauga um, Native Americans. There's a sect of the Cherokee. He was rather violent. Um, so it would make sense that he wouldn't be interested in talking about treaties right now. What this did, I'll go ahead and put these up here. This land, this red or orange portion here, was given to the Native Americans once more by this treaty. Now this again was organized by the Confederation government. So this repealed the border of what was settleable by whites back to what had previously been given to them all the way back in 1777. This portion up here in the blue was the only part that whites were allowed to settle in other than the middle part of Tennessee around Nashboro, or Nashville as we call it. This is where Dumplin' Creek had just put the people. So everyone from here all the way up here were now trespassers. The serious thing about that, being a trespasser, was the Treaty of Hopewell gave right to the Native Americans to run off by force all trespassers. So you have two groups of people. 
the Cherokee, and the Franklinites, who both claimed legal right to settle and hunt and live in these lands, with also the right to run off by force anyone who was there. And this erupted into the Cherokee War of 1786. The Cherokee started attacking Franklinites. And some of these Franklinites were very important people in Tennessee history. One of them noteworthily was James White. Anybody know who James White is? Okay, he's the guy that uh, founded Knoxville. 1786, he did that as a trespasser. Rebellion on the part of those who would have stopped the state of Franklin movement, they just made this treaty getting rid of the state of Franklin. Probably the temporary <coughs> holding uh, thing for them by making a treaty with the Cherokee, and let the Cherokee now run off them. And of course, as we well know, it's going to eventually go back to right. white settlers, but not under the uh, not under Franklin. control of the state of Franklin. Um, by the way, I'm guessing that Old Castle and Hanging Maw, those chiefs, are the ones that went after the Franklinites, but the ones who had entered in the Treaty of Dumplin' Valley, Dumplin uh, Creek. Creek, they probably did not, they probably weren't the ones who went after the Franklinites. They would have been subordinate to these. So even if they didn't desire to run the Franklinites off, they would have been taking their orders from these guys. Um, as I mentioned, Anku of Choda was a sent by Old Tassel. He agreed to the treaty. Um, the, uh, one stipulation to the Treaty of Dumplin' Creek was actually that they would consult with their uh, uh, superiors for authoritative um, confirmation. And that until that they had consulted with them, uh, this treaty was sort of flexible. But the Franklinites didn't recognize it that way. Exactly. Uh, right. And so the Franklinites, they went ahead and they considered it done and done. Yeah, and they're making the most of it today. Right. Um, we find out that Old Tassel and Hanging Maw, they were uh, waiting to parlay with the Confederation government. Uh, Old Tassel actually referred to them as uh, elder brother. He said our elder brother from the 13 states. So um, they were very ad uh, admirable of uh, the Confederation government. But this, this again <laughs> left the Franklinites in a bad place. Um, the Cherokee at this point could full-on attack them, uh, kill anyone found on this land, and nothing could happen. There was, there was no punishment for it. It's completely legal by the United States of America. So I would consider this the beginning of the end for the state of Franklin. They formed this Treaty of Coity. The Treaty of Coity uh, was organized by the Franklinites on the 3rd of August, 1786. The Native Americans that were present, Old Tassel, Hanging Maw, and a guy named John Watts who um, was partially white, partially Cherokee. He was leading the Cherokee warriors in the Cherokee War of 1786. They, uh, the, the people of Franklin invited them uh, at the end of a gun to come over and negotiate. And these negotiations went swimmingly for the Franklinites. Um, they gave up everything all the way down to the Hawassi River. The Franklinites won. They, they took these uh, Native American chiefs hostage and essentially said, you give us what we want or we're going to kill you. Um, John Sevier was a quarter mile away. So he very wisely was not seen there, but he almost certainly knew exactly what was happening. Um, a quarter mile, you could probably hear people talking. So... <laughs> Uh, he, he almost certainly knew what was happening, but the records say he was a quarter mile away. So while John Sevier was not directly related to this, I would certainly consider him implicated. So Treaty of Dumplin' Creek brought us down a little bit southwest of Knoxville. Treaty of Hopewell brought us back up essentially to Johnson City. In retaliation, they signed another treaty at gunpoint, bringing them down nearly to Chattanooga. Now this is a lot uh, to keep up with. These treaties became very confusing um, for the Franklinites, for the Confederation leadership, for the Cherokee, who goes where, who's allowed to be where. And this became a fiasco. It just became a, almost a joke of things being done legally, if you would like to call it that. So the decline. I have this map here so that you can see what counties are what because this is 
this is beginning to come back on itself. In August of 1786, North Carolina begins to appoint new county Senate, uh, Senate representatives over Washington County. Now, Washington County is one of the uh, counties in the state of Franklin. So what they're saying is we're not going to any longer even recognize that you are autonomous. We are going to start setting up our government in those areas again. Anyone care to guess who they set up as the Senate representative of Washington County? John Tipton. He was the one. The guy that hated John Sevier more than anybody in the world. They set him up as a Senate representative over Washington County. Now the capital of the state of Franklin, they had declared, was in Greenville. So you have that in Green County here. Washington County erupts into chaos. They don't know who they're even under the authority of anymore. Um, twice the courthouse in Washington County was stormed and sieged. Um, John Tipton and a, a group of fellow Tiptonites storm into the courthouse. They take all the paperwork out of the clerk's hands, and at gunpoint they run everybody out. And they say, this is now under the authority of the state of North Carolina. Shortly after, John Sevier heard of it, and he got a posse of his own together, and they storm in the courthouse. They take all the paperwork out of the clerk's hands, and they run them out at gunpoint, and they say, this is the authority of the state of Franklin. This was so, in my opinion, silly. Uh, John Sevier gave all of the paperwork in the courthouse to his brother James and said, hide these because he expected it to happen again. Um, James Severe, his brother, takes them and hides them in a cave. You can't get much more Tennessean than that. Uh, and forever, those documents were damaged and much of the history of Franklin and Western North Carolina at that point was lost. So this has become a disaster um, trying to legislate what's going on here. Eventually it erupted in what is loosely called the Battle of Franklin. Now if you Google the Battle of Franklin, you're going to find a, a Civil War battle. This is more of a skirmish, but what happened was February 27th through 29th, yes it was a leap year, um, the North Carolinian governor, or the North Carolinian government over in Washington County demanded taxes of John Sevier. Can you imagine why John Sevier would not pay taxes to a county that he believed to be in his state that he didn't live in that was requiring the taxes of him to go to another state. It made no sense to him to pay taxes to Washington County. That's not a North Carolinian state. I don't live there. Why would I pay taxes to them? But one person that did take these taxes very seriously was John Tipton. Exactly. He issued a warrant for John Sevier's arrest. You've not been paying your taxes, sir. North Carolina has a warrant out for your arrest because you've not paid your taxes in some time. Well, at this point, John Sevier was in southeast Tennessee fighting the Chickamauga, so what John Tipton did was he issued a warrant for some men to go seize John Sevier's property. They go to John Sevier's house, they take much of his property and all of his slaves, which to him was of great offense. Um, not only were slaves greatly valuable, but it was an intrusion. So, he hears about this. Where do you think they took the slaves? Do you think they took them to North Carolina to be held until he came and was in court? No. They took John Sevier's slaves to John Tipton's house. And John Tipton begins owning them and using them. So what John Sevier saw this as was John Tipton has robbed my house while I'm gone. So he rounds up a posse of about 100 guys, and they show up at John Tipton's house. Now they encircle his house, and he sends somebody to the front door. He knocks on the door, hands him a piece of paper, and it says, Surrender or die. You have 30 minutes. Tipton tells the guy, Get out of here. Shuts the door in his face. Well, they wait that day. The next day, February 28th, they send another guy down with a piece of paper. It says, Surrender or die. You've got today. Tipton screams out the door, I'm not doing it. What they didn't know was that night, he had sent one of his family members out. They'd snuck out in the, no in the night, gone and told the North Carolinian militia, John Sevier's going to kill John Tipton. So the militia comes, they show up, 
On the second day, while they're marching to, the, to John Tipton's house, John Sevier decides, I'm not going to rush in there and kill him. I'll look like a bad guy. We're just going to siege him. We're not going to let anybody come in or anybody go out. One bad thing that happened was there were two women walking down the road. They asked to go to uh, John Tipton's house. They said no. They began to run towards the house, so they shot them. Uh, one of the women was shot through the shoulder. There's no record of whether or not they died, but they had just shot two unarmed women in the late 1700s. Even that looked very, very badly. John Sevier's men shot these two women down for trying to get into Tipton's house. So this looked very badly on John Sevier. Um, the 29th, the militiamen show up from North Carolina, and they run off John Sevier and his posse. Now, the dates on this are very important. John Sevier had been elected in November of 1785. He took office and started in 1786. Well, on March the 1st of 1788, his gubernatorial term expired. He was no longer the governor of the state of Franklin. Which didn't exist. Which didn't exist. <laughs> he was no longer the governor of a state that didn't exist. So, his term ends. The very next day after this siege, after he's ridden away into the night, the state of Franklin elects Isaac Shelby as their new governor, the man who fought alongside Sevier at the Battle of King's Mountain. So, so elected governor of what? The state of Franklin. So I thought you said the state of Franklin was no longer the first. <laughs> no, he's not the governor. He's not the governor anymore. John Sevier's term as governor of a state that does not exist is okay, well, over. Isaac Shelby now a governor. He is now the governor of the state of Franklin. Which doesn't exist. Which does not exist. Well, it's it's not been don't let me confuse you on that. It's not been dissolved. The state of Franklin still entirely exists in their minds. Yeah, that's right where it exists. Yeah, it's the only place that it exists in their minds. Uh, North Carolina doesn't recognize it. The Confederation government doesn't recognize it. Spain, France, they don't recognize it. The Cherokee don't recognize it. This is just their imaginary world. We're our own state now. They are... <laughs> they need to make a play of this conspiracy. Absolute Hatfields and McCoys, yeah. This would sell a million tickets. Um, some sort of who's on first type thing. That doesn't even exist. It's not how this works. Right. So, yes, Isaac Shelby is elected governor of the state of Franklin in their minds. And uh, John Sevier just takes up living in Jonesboro as the colonel of the Franklinite militia. One small caveat. Isaac Shelby declined. He says, I'm not going to be the state of a governor of a government or the governor of a state that does not exist. Uh, he was tied up trying to get Kentucky accepted as a state independent of Virginia. He would eventually become the governor of that state, which is an actual state to this day. So he declined. He says, No, I'm not going to do that. So the state of Franklin was left without a governor. And they've got John Sevier as the colonel of their militia. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about John Tipton? I mean, his house just got sieged. They almost killed him. They nearly killed two women. If they didn't kill at least one, what's he do? Well, he goes back to North Carolina, and he entreats them to issue a warrant for John Sevier's arrest. He's so mad that this happened, he wants him arrested. What's he want him arrested for? Treason against the state of North Carolina. Well, this was not news. Um, John Sevier had been accused of treason since 1784, four years previously, when he was founding the state of Franklin. So the state government issues a warrant. They say, of course, yeah, we'll issue a warrant for John Sevier to be arrested on, uh, you know, on the charges of treason. They never in a million years expected him to actually be arrested for treason. He had been accused of treason for years. John Tipton arrested him in October and brought him to North Carolina for trial. How he found him is actually funny. I don't have that in here. Uh, John Sevier was in Jonesboro. He was trying to buy some liquor on a Sunday, which was illegal, and uh, he arrested him for that, and then brought him to North Carolina on trial for treason. The sheriff of the area where he was brought to have his trial was a veteran of Kings Mountain. 
seeing John Severe arrested for treason, he went in, unshackled him, and told him to go home. All charges were dropped. John Severe was very quiet after that. He, he returned um, in February of the next year, and on promise of being made a North Carolina state senator, he took the oath of allegiance to North Carolina. So now the state of Franklin has no governor, and the best prospect that they had is taking his oath of allegiance to be a, a government official in North Carolina. In November, John Severe helped push for a second session act, for which he was awarded the position of Brigadier General over the territorial militia by the um, Confederation government. William Blunt was appointed governor of the new Southwest Territory. Now the Southwest Territory was formed under the Northwest Ordinance, which you guys just read about. So the Southwest Territory is what? It it essentially started in current day Kentucky and went down to Louisiana. Um, and William Blunt would uh, be the governor of that until it actually formed the state of Tennessee. Blunt negotiated in 19, or 1791 the Treaty of the Holston, which ended any land disputes caused by the treaties of Dumplin' Creek, Hopewell, and Coity. So what happened was the state of Franklin lost their governor. They couldn't get a new one. Their best prospect went to their enemy. And then a treaty was made that essentially voided and nullified all of the treaties that they had ever been a part of. So it was really like the state of Franklin never happened. And that's why none of you had heard of it. And that's why it's so hard to understand how that they had a governor, but they weren't a state, but, and all of that. It was completely wiped away. For the most part, I, I'm, he made me aware that you have read somewhat about Shays' Rebellion. Um, it's similarly looked upon as Shays' Rebellion. It was an attempt by a group of people to find an autonomous government for themselves to take care of themselves, but for the most part, this is just sim simply not known. Um, there's very little written about this in pop culture. Most of the literature on this is scholarly. Um, in my opinion, uh, the bad guys won because uh, William Blunt, who was the one that had made all of these uh, treaties so that he could gain a bunch of land, he becomes the governor. Uh, John Severe signs back on with North Carolina because they're going to make him a senator, and then he cedes away the entire area that he had just fought for independence of so that they would make him a brigadier general. Um, it's, it seems like the bad guys won. Is that the end of it, or is there more to say? That is the end of it. That's what the end. He, he does. Uh, after Tennessee is made an official state in 1796, they elect him as governor. Uh, he is the first governor. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this one's a real state. He's a real governor now. Um, he's the first and third governor of the state of Tennessee. Um, Isaac Shelby becomes the governor of Kentucky after it becomes a state. Um, William Cock, who had taken the letter for statehood to um, the, uh, the uh, Articles of Confederation, he becomes the first senator of the state of Tennessee. So these same people, they stay here. They are still all here when all of it becomes a state. For the most part, it's a, a lot of the same people. So in concept, this might have worked, but it just didn't. You said William Blunt was appointed governor of the new Southwest Territory. I missed that. What was the topic? It, it's a portion of land that was given to the uh, Confederation government under the Northwest Ordinance. So this is what they originally intended. They wanted all of this land to be ceded to them so that there were no conflicts of uh, territorial claim. What happened to the Treaty of Holston? How much? Remember that big, remember the Treaty of what is it? A Hopewell. Hopewell? Yeah. It looks like they're preserving a whole bunch of just the Native Americans. I'm going to guess right. the Treaty of Holston weakens the very little. It does. If, if the Treaty of Holston is the beginning of the um, removal of Native Americans. After the land grab in 83 and the session in 84, mm. what, what happened during that time to the, the federal land grab for revolutionary war veterans? Do you, did you get any of that from reading? I, would, I, would, I don't. I certain acreages right. in, 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 at that time period, I thought. Right. Now, um, I can tell you this from experience. Um, my eighth great-grandfather fought in the Revolutionary War at Kings Mountain. He was given a land grant in um, 
current day Sevierville. And he came over in 1785, which he would have been a Franklinite, Franklin. if he wanted to call himself that. I hope he didn't. Um, but I know they maintained their land. Jason uh, Emmert is another one. He's currently running from, uh, for office. But those land grants were from the, the Confederation. They were. They not, and so they were not bogus, if they, even wherever they were. They exactly. Were right. It sounds like it was done by that Carolina legislature. Would they maybe, it was yeah, maybe so. right before we cede it to the, to the Congress or to the Continental, to the, the whole United States. Let's make sure a, a bunch of this land ends up in our hands before we sell it all. Yeah, like here, right here in Hamlin County, out here on the, on the North Central River, some of those lands were granted to third party football. But we still were investing. Right. Absolutely. I think the time period was important. I'm actually thinking about that. In the, um, the Constitution of the State of Franklin that they formed in 85, um, it's, I forget the exact wording, it's, it's goofy, that's why I remember it. They wanted all deeds for land to be recognized under the state of Franklin that even had been deeded by the state of North Carolina. The wording that's so goofy says, even as if the state of Franklin had never even existed. Um, so they're, they're acting like these are legitimate even though we didn't grant them. Um, so they would have maintained that, come to think of it. Yeah. Great questions. All right. Yay. <laughs> yeah, learn. absolutely. I learned some stuff. I never knew about the state of Franklin. Did you guys learn some stuff too? Did you learn some? I learned more about it than I did, though. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. One, one other question. Yeah. Do you know where the, the town of Spencer, Caswell, and Wayne, do you know where those names came from? Did Not you? right off. I, I have no idea. Not right off. Wayne came from General Wayne. And had Anthony. Right. Anthony now you can see, actually, I don't mention this either, but... Um, when they sent their petition to the uh, Confederation government um, trying to get granted statehood, they were actually then called the state of Frank land um, because that literally translated meant the land of the free. Uh, when it was voted down, they changed it to Franklin trying to get uh, support from Benjamin Franklin. And they did the same thing when naming, naming counties. They named counties like Sevier County and Cock County and all of that. What's the evidence for the, your description of the Battle of Franklin mm -hmm. between Tipton Heights and, fr and uh, mm -hmm. severe people. What's the evidence for that? Um, is it hearsay? Is it no? Stories? John is Tipton it? wrote an account of it. John Tipton. Um, so did? yes, he he wrote an so account of it. That's one side of it, right? And that's one side of it. Now, Do we have anything from the other side? Because severe doesn't sound like a very. I mean, for the man who distinguished himself at Kings Mountain, he gets there and sends a note to the right. <laughs> Thirty yeah. minutes and you're dead, and then he waits <laughs> a day, and yeah. then it's like after the fact that he thinks it's. To secure the perimeter and not yeah. let anybody in or out, not anticipating that helps him to come. I mean, it's right. it's really yeah. poor leadership. Poorly if, done. If that's what he was actually trying to do. Yeah. So, I mean, was he drunk the whole time? Or I don't know. <laughs> I mean, mean he's, 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 but he if it was one sided, he may right. have had other stuff up his sleeve that he didn't know. Yeah. It's yeah. Tipton's story, right? Do we right. Have any For the most part, it's Tipton's story. He was known as, as a top secret guy. Severe? You, you would think he lived in there at the distance. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of surprising to. to, to no. Equivocate like that. Were you telling me Franklin Knots or Franklin Knights? Franklin Knights, uh, N-I-T-E-S. Yeah, yeah. For the most part, that's be, that's what they'll be referred to. Um, but again, it's mm -hmm. all informal because it was never really a thing. And all it really is for us is this: all of this western territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River is up for grabs, <laughs> and people want to get a hold of it. Uh, we've already had these people who moved down here and they live on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains and who are the over the mountain men. Uh, will they get to make their own future? How much of this will become devolved to them? But what they're up against is the powerhouse down in North Carolina. Those statesmen, these folks who live over here like Severe and, and some of these other early Scots-Irish who moved over here, they would love to proclaim their own state. Maybe they had a big vision. We'll be the big men here, I'm gonna guess. But the men over here in North Carolina who control the legislature, they did not want some upstart people from uh, the west side of Appalachia to determine the future of this land. And I think that's what it came down to, was this struggle back and forth between these two groups. And the ones in the best position to win were the ones with the most clout and control and the most power, and also most influence in the Continental Congress. 
over to the Confederation government, right? Because they moved against it ultimately. But that Treaty of Hope, well, we get mighty in here from Ringo. Ringo? I mean, no, no representation from Ringo. There's a, re, uh, a reproduction uh, structure cavern in Greenville, the capital of the state. Oh, is that right? So they remember it. Maybe it's this one. Yep. So that video lecture I gave you last week, which is which is actually edited, had all of this information. This should look familiar to you on the Northwest Ordinance. The Annapolis Conference, the failed Annapolis Conference, Shays Rebellion, and why it was significant in getting the attention of the property class. How they finally meet in Philadelphia, and they come up with a new plan for a stronger national government. And that James Madison, with his Virginia plan, laying out the, the three branches of government and the checks and balances system, uh, because of his... Um, him being having devised that, he gets called the father of the Constitution. The Great Compromise uh, was they were stuck and they couldn't move forward on adopting this legislation. And the two sticking points was what we've done is we've created a two house, two chambers for legislation. One's going to be the People's House with uh, proportional representation, where the bigger states will dominate. But then in the Senate, they'll be all equally voiced. Uh, the southern states wanted to count their slaves as part of their, for the census, so they could have more representation in the legislature. And the northern states were like, well, that's not right. That would be arbitrarily giving you more weight in the Congress for people that you're saying aren't people. <laughs> If you're, it's like, do you want to count your horses and pigs too? I mean, I mean, you're giving them the same rights. So that was a, st a sticking point because the th southern states were afraid that the more populous northern states would dominate the national legislature. What was the other one? Sticking point. I can't think of it right now. Oh, it was the splitting of the national legislature into two bodies, right? A Senate with the Senate House Representatives and this uh, allow, it allows the southern states, of course, to count 60% of their population. Here goes another three-fifths this time, right? Once they get that agreement, they can work out the other details and they lay out the Constitution and they roll it out and Franklin, sorry, Benjamin Franklin is asked by a newspaper person what is this document? What is this president? Do we have a republic or do we have a, a, a monarchy? And he said, you have a republic if you can keep it. If you can, if, it, if the president doesn't turn into a monarch, then what we've created is a, president, is a republic. <laughs> but he, he says, if you can keep it, because he knows the history of the world, is that republican form of government is usually not long for the world. And we went through all of this in the video lecture. And I talked about the uh, Federalist Papers. <laughs> I have to bring this up. This is really ironic. This is the 68th Federalist Papers. I think you asked me about some Federalist Papers, Judge. Uh, did you not? This one's ironic. It's on the Electoral College. It's trying to explain the Electoral College. And they're, what their explanation for it is this. They don't want any existing power that's always sitting. They want a new group every time that would be, well, unaffected. But it's ironic what he says. Nothing was to be more desired than that every practical obstacle should be opposed to cabal. A cabal is a group of conspirators trying to take power. Intrigue and corruption. These most deadly adversaries of Republican government might naturally have been expected to have made their approaches from one or more quarter of the country, but chiefly from the desire in foreign powers to gain an improper ascendant in our councils. A little ironic there. 
how could they better gratify this than by raising a creature of their own to chief magistrate? <laughs> it's the whole Mueller investigations about the irony of this. When I read this today, I was like, oh my gosh. But the convention have already guarded against all danger of this sort with the most provident and judicious attention. They have not made the appointment of the president to depend on any pre-existing body of men who might be tampered with beforehand to prostitute their votes, but they have referred it in the first instance to the, an immediate act of the American the people of America to be exerted in the choice of persons for the temporary and sole purpose of making the appointment. So the Electoral College is going to be a temporary body based on the outcome of an election so that we have a brand new group of people who come to Washington, well, come, in this case Washington, on uh, about December 20th to cast votes based on the states, how the states voted. But I thought that was terribly ironic, is it not? By raising a creature of their own to the chief magistrate. I thought you were talking about demagoguery and populism also has a... Oh, absolutely. Populism. Yes, we talk about that in here. And here is our Bill of Rights. Uh, you know that the Constitution got passed in Philadelphia without any constraints on the government. And a lot of the states were like, we're not going to agree. You laid out what all the powers of the government are, but where are the constraints on the power of the government? And North Carolina, New York, and Massachusetts, I believe, would not agree to move this legislation, would not ratify it without amendments. Uh, John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and John, James Madison and others, they do finally say, you're right, we need to write down restrictions on what the Congress can't do and what the federal government can't do to citizens, but we can't amend it now. We've got to, to ratify it, go into, call forward this new government, and then that new government can immediately amend those things, and they will amend the Constitution. That leads Massachusetts and New York to say yes, but North Carolina says we'll wait and see. And Delaware never even bothers to vote because they think they're going to get swallowed by the country. And in keeping their word, they establish these amendments, which place restrictions on the power of the federal Congress, the legislative branch, that is, right? You can't, they can't make a law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. The Congress can't ab write a law to abridge the freedom of speech or the press or the right to peacefully assemble. Mm. Second Amendment, the, the uh, Congress can't, well, they have to have a caveat here, don't they? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free people, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, right? So. They can't make a law saying that you can't have guns. They can make a law saying what kind of guns you can have. But this other part is about the process of the government putting their eyes on you and saying you're guilty of a crime. We're trying to create protections so that we make sure we go to a trial by jury and then we also make sure that the government can't just come into your house anytime without a warrant. And if they're going to get a warrant, they've got to have a lot of evidence here. So all of these constraints, gosh, can you imagine having a, a government operating without these constraints? This is absolutely necessary and brilliant. And I already talked about how President Washington decides to try to bring together, he understands quite clearly that the country's been divided over this idea of a national government. And he actually brings in, uh, ironically or perhaps unexpectedly, people who disagree with each other very much. He brings in Hamilton as Secretary of Treasury and Jefferson, one of the most outspoken persons about this new government, and he makes him his Secretary of State, which is a very important position. And then, as you know, these two have very different view, visions of the future. And this is all about that first essay question of yours, which asks you to, to look at the development of two political parties in America during the early republic. Partisan politics started early for us, as you all know, I think, well now. Um, let's see. I handled all these in the ID handled uh, Hamilton's report on manufacturing and how he wants a strong national government. 
supported by propertied interests and patronage, robust commercial and industrial economic growth. These are his visions, commerce, cities, trade. And he lays out what he wants Congress to do in order to pursue the kind of vision he has for the country. He needs a national bank to be chartered. There needs to be a National Bank of America. Federal Reserve. N a later manifestation of it will be the Federal Reserve. This one is going to be a private bank capitalized by private wealthy people that are going to be the bank that the United States Treasury will put all of its money in. And it happens to be a branch bank. It's got several, it's got a couple different branches across the East Coast. Uh, the Jeffersonians don't like this thing, this bank, and they try to block it. How can you block legislation? Or how can you say this legislation is wrong? Because I, I, there's something I want y'all to come away with here in just a second about when you're disagreeing. If the government creates a law that we think is not right, isn't, isn't there something fundamental we can say about the law? There you go. It's unconstitutional. And, they, and this, is, this is what I want you to come away with. It's the interpretation of the Constitution. It has been a really big issue for us, and it remains so today. If you'll look back at the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to the Constitution, uh, okay, the Ninth Amendment. No, is that Ninth? Can't. This is really, I don't know why I did this one. Can't I can't either. Ninth Amendment. It's a mess. Protections of rights not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. Here's what it says. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Also, powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it, are reserved to the states, respectively, to the people. This question becomes, Hamilton wants a national bank. And the Jeffersonians say, that's unconstitutional. They say, where in the Constitution does it say that the Congress can make a national bank? The Jeffersonians want to be what are called strict constructionists. Oh, this is good in forever. Oh, my word. I had no idea how long that word that word was. It's got to be 20 letters. Strict constructionists. You want to pass a law? Show us in the Constitution where it says the government has the power to pass that law. You want to pass a law requiring all Americans to pay a fine if they don't buy health insurance? Show us in the Constitution where it says you can do that. That's a strict constructionist. Now, Hamilton, on the other hand, wants to talk about, anybody, did I talk about an election? Oh. You want to? Okay. What does, if you want to talk, if you want to give the authority to the government and say that it's not possible that everything could have been written down in the Constitution, they're going to want to talk about, you'll see. Some interpretation. And, can you get it? Oh, implied. Implied powers. Uh, so people who want to expand the power of the, the federal government and take it into realms not otherwise described, they're going to talk about an implied power, saying, well, you can't expect them to figure out every scenario in which the government would have certain power. It's implied to have this power. So from the very beginning, we get into contests among Americans. We divide into camps. We're not the first, when there's no, I don't want you in any way to think that we're somehow unique in doing this. This is what everybody has done in every society. We get together in groups and we try to get policies passed that help us and that reflect our interests and move us forward economically. And what's quite honestly happening, the property people, especially the northern property people, commercial, financial, along the coast, they see the national government reflecting their interests and doing things that they want to see the country develop as. But 
their ideas of what's good for them is going to scare the southern elites and they're going to think we don't like this and they generally speaking the agriculturalists won't like it either they don't like his idea that we're going to put a tariff on imported products that will then be spent on building roads and clearing waterways they don't like the idea of uh, excise taxes I, you may remember that um, Hamilton wants the federal government through the National Bank to take over all outstanding state debt from the Revolutionary War. Remember that? He wants to do a kind of a bond swap. All the states had outstanding debt from the Revolutionary War. He wants this new bank to issue new bonds. It'll pay off the debt of the states and the federal government will assume this debt. Can anybody tell me what I said his purpose in that was for the video lecture? Yeah, he's like, he gets chosen by the United States Congress or something? That's Shays' Rebellion, but why is, that has to do with Massachusetts issues with their, but why does Hamilton want there to be a national debt? Y'all remember it? He, he wa what is that? What? They, he, who's going to buy this debt? And the northern elites too. He wants the property people of America to be invested in the success of the national government. Because if the national government falls apart, are they going to get their, their money back? The answer is no. And this is, we're talking about a 10, 15 year payoff for this long term debt. So it would get buy in from the property people who, you know, it wasn't clear that they really wanted to come together in Philadelphia and give this kind of power. They're worried about it devolving and coming apart. And one of the best ways to tie the country together, the wealthy people of the country who might want to otherwise pull power away, is to have their future economic life be based on the success of the national government. This is his vision for the future. Large commercial cities on the coast federal roads connecting them to the hinterland where people in villages appear, agricultural products flowing towards the coast, and finished products that are imported from abroad or and beginning to be manufactured in America moving out, and we have growing trade and commerce. And then we talked, talked about Jefferson and his vision was for a virtuous republic of yeoman farmers and independent craftsmen, and he doesn't like cities. And he's afraid of this national government and, and where the whole thing's going. I'm not going to go through all that again. But I can go to, finally, some new material for you, the Whiskey Rebellion. And by the way, Alexander Hamilton gets his way at the beginning. He's in, he's in the driver's seat. Uh, I can tell you this. By the way, can you tell me the names of the two parties that are forming? One's forming around Jefferson and his vision of the country, and one's coming around Hamilton and his vision of the country. Federalists, Federalists are with? Hamilton. Yeah, you got it. it means they believe in federal power. And then Jefferson did not want to be known as the anti-federalist. Very good. But I can't remember. Democratic Republicans. There you go. They call themselves the Democratic Republicans. We're for a republic and we're for democracy, which is uh, uh, the uh, allowing every male citizen to have a vote and not just a government based on the wealthy. So, now, I put up there the question, King George I, um, President Washington understands that he is setting precedents. You ever heard the term of a president before? It's kind of funny here, a president setting a precedent. Uh, it, a precedent is the first time that something's done, and it sets a stage for what is to come afterwards. And he is cognizant of this. He's aware that how he acts as president will shape what we think of the presidency. There has been no president before, and I, here's what I'd like you to come away with, is that he does begin to get a little high for his horse, so according to the Republicans. They believe that he was, became too pompous, that when he would have state dinners, he wouldn't look you in the eye, just like the king wouldn't look somebody in the eye. He became more aloof. He traveled around New York City, where the legislature met at that time. 
in a uh, carriage with a whole group of servants in velvet. He looked like the king going around the city. Now, the Republican people are going, that's not what we want here. And they're beginning to get worried that the president is being set up to be like a, like a king. That's when they, and they begin to say, what's he up to? And some grumbling goes on, but it's President Washington or General Washington. And they don't say too much publicly about it during his administration. During his administration, they do figure out um, how to set up the judiciary, that is the different districts of the federal court system. I ought to have Judge Inman come up and explain the federal court system. I've seen him do it in another class when he was a visiting lecturer and did a fantastic job. Might bring you back in for that in the future, since you don't <laughs> bring your PowerPoint and explain this to them. Um, I will say this, most of the federal courts in the early period are going to reflect the interests of Hamilton and the Federalists. And how long are their appointments? Do you remember that? How long are federal judges in? Well, you got the House of Representatives two years, President four years, Senators six years. Courts are lifers. I always like to call them lifers because it almost sounds like what they give out um, sometimes. <laughs> They can stay forever, and this is really going to give the Federalists some power there. They, they want the court system to reflect their interests, and none more so will do that than John Marshall, who I like, actually. All right, um, this is the Whiskey Rebellion, an ID for you. Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and plenty other uh, Republican leaders don't like Hamilton. And they're writing essays in newspapers, editorials in newspapers. And they're meeting together in taverns and they're saying, Hamilton and his group, they want to tax us on whiskey, federal taxes on whiskey, and we're never going to see the money. It's going to get pushed over somewhere and spent somewhere else. And it's wrong and we don't need it. If you've got leaders like Jefferson saying that and Patrick Henry saying that, how do you think the farmers out in the western part of Pennsylvania are going to feel about it when federal tax collectors come to pick it up? If you've got leaders saying that this is wrong, well, the answer is the people, the western farmers, there are, lots of farmers are angry in different states, but the ones in western Pennsylvania go up in revolt and they start beating federal tax collectors. They start treating them the same way we treated the British tax collectors in 17... 64. What year is Whiskey Rebellion right now? This is going to be, that's a good question. You got Whiskey Rebellion up there for me? It's in his first administration. Anybody got Whiskey Rebellion date for me? Well, we'll I'll tell you what, we'll look it up over the, over the break, which is coming. So, farmers in western part of Pennsylvania, probably on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, defy the federal government and go after them. This is an act of rebellion. 1791, thank you very much. Y'all remember the preamble to the Constitution? We the people of the United States of America, in order to... A more perfect union. More perfect than what? In other words, we had a union, but it wasn't perfect. What was that one called? The Articles of Confederation? And then what's the next phrase there? You got it? Um, ensure, that's right, to ensure domestic tranquility. Is this domestic tranquility? Nor was Shays' Rebellion before that. President Washington takes up the other part of his authority. We call him President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief. So he is going to be able to call up state militias and take the field, putting on, we call it the mantle of commander-in-chief. I guess he calls, sends a letter to Betty. No, it's a Betty. What's his wife's name? Martha Washington. Martha, please get my uniform out. I'm hoping I can still fit into it and send it to me. And he takes the field. And militias from different states show up under his command. And he marches on into western Pennsylvania. Does he want to kill his fellow Americans? He does not. 
Did he fight with them in the Revolutionary War? He did. Is he going to put up with their rebellion? No. He sends out um, emissaries who negotiate, and they say, General Washington's here. He does not want to spank your butts, but he will, very much so. And you guys need to go home. And he says, if you want to change the law in America, then you got to win elections. But we live in a country which we're bound by the laws that are made by our representatives in the national legislature. Please go home. Don't make him do this. And the Whiskey Rebellion dissolves and they go home. I think he probably turns around to Alexander Hamilton and says, are you sure about this Whiskey Rebellion thing? I mean, when people go up in arms, that's pro that may be an indication that we're not doing something right. Huh. The next idea I have for you is his farewell address. <laughs> he is reelected in for a second term of four years. And what the single most important thing he does next is that he quits or resigns. Well he refuses to stand for a third term. He refuses to stand for a third term. Hamilton wants him to do it. I think if Hamilton could have had his way, he would have had uh, Washington pick him up as vice president, drop John Adams, and then that Washington would stay in the presidency until he dies. And then who would become president? Hamilton, Hamilton would. And that might have set a precedent, precedent, that if the people keep voting you back in power, you might as well just stay there for the rest of your life. There'll be no limit on the amount of time. But thank George Washington said no. In order to re preserve the republic, he does not think that it's proper for any so far man to hold the office of president more than two terms. And he steps down. Now you guys know today nobody can do more than two. But for 150 years, nobody did more than two because they all respect, it became the law, it, the informal law of the land. Nobody stands, it's understood you don't stand for more than two terms. But Franklin Roosevelt, because of the war in Europe, ends up getting, actually getting elected for a fourth term. And the Republicans in the 1950s passed a, <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, an amendment saying a president can't serve more than two terms, and so now it is the law of the land. But in his farewell address, I want you to, uh, we're going to look at some aspects of that, and then I'll give you a break. Uh, let me say this about the farewell address before I have you start reading things. Think about Washington as the patriarch of a family, a grandfather whose children are squabbling. And that he's worried that the family's not going to stay together. For him, metaphorically speaking, the country, the states are his children. And they are, they are divided into different groups. And they don't like each other. And they're probably not going to stay together as a union. That's what he's afraid of. And so in his farewell address, he writes an address to the country. And it goes into newspapers. And across the country, people read Washington's address. And what it really is, is a final letter to his children. I'm heading to the grave. I'd like to go away knowing that my family stays together. Here's the things that worry me. Number th one thing that worries him is partisan politics. He does not like seeing Americans dividing into groups, Federalists, Anti-Federalists who now begin to say really bad things about each other. He will call these things, by the way, we don't quite, he doesn't quite yet know what to call these things because we're the first country to do stuff. Well, eventually we'll call them parties. But let's go ahead and start with this. He wants America to stay together, but America's a new idea, right? It's brand new. I mean, there are these states and that's been our identity. So here's what he says here, the name of American, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism. More than any, these are hard words, appellation derived from local discriminations. Appellations means 
name. What he means is, don't think of yourself first as a Virginian. Don't think of yourself as a North Carolinian. Don't think of yourself as Massachusetts. Think first of yourself as an American. How many of you, don't, would you say that we do that today? We first, our first level of identity is American. And then it might be region, southerner. And then it might be southern Appalachian. And then ten, or Tennessee would be before that in there. But he knows that all of the 13 states, and now we're adding more, most of the people living there have an identity of loyalty to their state more than the idea of American. And I can tell you that Robert E. Lee will say, right, he couldn't turn his back on his country. And what did he mean by that? Virginia. His country was Virginia. And George Washington, who's from Virginia, he understands that this is the case. And he's saying you all need to think first and foremost about that you're loyal to America and not loyal to one of the states. Okay. Now, don't, you know, obviously don't bother to write this down, but what he, what you want to say here is the blessings of, liber- of the blessings of union, the blessings of union, the benefits of union. If we remain together in a union, we'll have greater strength, greater resources, proportionally greater security from external dangers. And of what is of inestimable value, Being together, we will derive from union an exemption from those broils and wars between themselves which so frequently afflict neighboring countries not tied together by the same government. We who know history, he's inferring, understand that all countries fight each other if they're not under the same government. That's why kind of empires make sense because it stops the warfare. So if we remain in the union, the biggest blessing of all to us, we will never have warfare among our states because warfare among states is really hard on civilian populations. And it's just devastating. If he was to look back at Europe and look at the, the different wars ravishing across even England during the Civil War or in Germany during the, the, the Thirty Years' War, it's devastating. Nothing is worth more than peace here among neighboring states. And the only way to do that is through being tied together by one government. Now, he begins to complain about party politics. And I think this might be a little bit of a warning. I don't know why that's doing it that way. A bit of a warning to Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists. And by the way, it is considered that uh, Hamilton probably contributed a lot to this, a lot to this, the writing of the farewell address. All obstructions to the execution of the laws of the Federal Congress, all combinations and associations, serve to organize faction, uh, disagreement, to give it an artificial and extraordinary force, to put it in the place of the delegated will of the nation, the will of a party, often a small but artful and enterprising minority of the community. He's saying, that the, you, we get these, as we divide into groups and we get parties, there's going to be party leaders who try to really exert the will of the party over the will of the nation. But check out this next one. I think it's pretty interesting. Here's where he begins to worry about party loyalty could produce us with uh, a fascist leader, basically, we would say. Combinations or associations, I'll call them parties of the above description, may now and then answer popular ends, right? The people might have to get up you know, together and call for something, but they are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be able to subvert the power of the people and usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines or the parties which lifted them to unjust dominion. Oh my word. This is anticipating fascism, right? This is, this is Mussolini and Hitler. And these parties and party loyalty to a leader could result in the domination of the country by just the party. And this is, I think it's brilliant on him or Hamilton's part, whoever wrote that. Very great warning. How could farmers ever <laughs> Fair point. Uh, there, 
how literate were Americans? No, they were. Um, I think the further west you go into the frontier and uh, their debate, oh, you know, I, th I think a lot of, I mean, the, you could look at newspaper readership. I mean, the fact that so many newspapers are being generated and there's not much else to do. Uh, reading's a big thing. And reading the Bible, I think it's, we're a pretty literate group. How, and, but you'd have to be used to some pretty uh, esoteric words here. His final warning about parties, he says, if parties ever form based on regions of the country, a northern one and a southern one, then we're screwed. <laughs> In contemplating the causes which may disturb our union, it occurs as a matter of serious concern that any grounds should have been furnished for characterizing parties by geographical discriminations, northern and southern whence designing men may endeavor to excite a belief that there is a difference, a real difference of local interests and views. <laughs> you know, it's, we call that prescient. If y'all want your GRE word for the day, we've had a couple of them. Ah, uh, prescient. Oh, I shouldn't do this if I can't spell it. I thought it did have it right there. To see into the future, to foresee what's coming. Another one I gave y'all, I think I put some of these on. Um, oh, precedent. Help me out, folks. Is that precedent? Yes. Oh. The first time something's done that makes it a custom is a precedent. He goes home. The statue of, of George Washington up at George Washington University in D.C. where I went to grad school at. Uh, their favorite picture of him. I'll give it to you as he's leaving. He has done, well, he's done what Cincinnatus did back in the Roman times. In fact, he's going to be part of a club called Cincinnatus. He has taken off his coat and laid it, and this is his military coat. He's laid it over this column, and he's hung up his sword, and he's taken up his walking stick, and he's gone back to his plantation where he is going to take care of his land. He came to the aid of the country when it was in need of leadership, but he's not gonna try to hold on to that leadership, expand his power, and benefit some way by it. And he is referencing a man named Cincinnatus in Roman times when the Roman Senate, if they were ever in really bad trouble, they could get rid of their two consuls who ruled for one year. They didn't trust anyone with too much power and they could elect a dictator. It's kind of a funny thing to elect. For six months, we give all authority to someone who we completely trust with power because we know they don't want the power. And so in the Roman story, uh, this man, Cincinnatus, gets approached by his sons and say, Father, they've elected you as dictator. We're being invaded by a foreign force. You've got to get your toga, and we've got to go. And you've got, he had six months authority. He beats the foreign force within weeks, and he does not even bother to, to carry out the rest of the mandate that was given to him. Instead, Cincinnatus goes back to his, to his farm. And that is what motivated George Washington. I'd say his understanding of history really informs him, his ideas of militias and the Persians. All this stuff is going to inform his decisions. But that's what we love about him. Does not try to hold on to power. That's very unusual. A wise man to do that. Let's take a break, and then we'll come back and get our early... The, we'll continue... Um, I'll try to look it up for you. It's, it's like the word Cincinnati. It's very close to it. In fact, one of the early organizations that Washington was involved with, was it the Brothers of Cincinnati? What was that called? That fraternal organization. Lucretius Quintus Cincinnati. He's been, oh, look at that. He's got his fascists, fascists. 
he's been given the symbolic authority. He's, his plow is back here. I guess that's him giving it back. That's pretty cool, too. But there's his name. Roman patrician, statesman, and military leader in the early Republic who becomes a legendary figure of Roman virtues, particularly Roman manliness and civic, civic virtue. So, all right. We'll all take a break and come back in about... There is a theme that you're going to pick up on in this battle between the parties that's going to emerge. Y'all know today that we've got parties and we hate on each other, right? And it's hard to believe that we can keep the country together. Luckily, <laughs> you, can't, you don't know who's what, typically speaking, right? If you're living somewhere, you're like, wow, is that one of those Republicans or Democrats? I guess if we were different ethnicities and all Republicans were one ethnic group and all Democrats were another ethnic group, it might be uh, more warfare among us based on the antipathy, the, the, the anger that we have for each other in politics. But both sides are going to appeal for the American people to vote for them. Vote for us because the other party is, going, is bad for America. And one of the things that both sides will hone on is that the other side wants to take power for themselves and make a monarchy or make a usurper of power. So here's what I'd like you to know. The Jeffersonians or the Anti-Federalists or the Democratic Republicans, they're going to always accuse the Federalists of being monarchists. You guys are trying to set up a monarchy again. Of course, George Washington stepping down kind of undermined that uh, argument that the Republicans had. And for, for simplicity, I'm just going to call them Republicans if I could, even though Jefferson had very different views about re Republicans from today. On the other hand, the Federalists are going to accuse the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, of potentially giving birth to unprincipled men, cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men who can whip up the passions of the people and say, vote for me and I'll protect you from the property people, a, a Nathaniel Bacon. And when T Andrew Jackson takes the presidency in 1928, 1828, they're going to say, that's exactly what we talked about. Here is this Democratic Party, this big party that's got behind Jackson. And Jackson is this cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled man. And they're going to call him King Andrew I because that's the worst thing you can call him. He's trying to destroy our republic. The other side always, that's the thing that each party proclaims about the other one. You're trying to destroy our republic, our system of government. So a little tip for you there as we go ahead. All right, here is some simple IDs after all that long talking. I'm not going to not talk long. I'm just not going to. There'll be more compact IDs. Um, your ID here is Pierre Lafont. Pierre Charles Lafont. Is his name up there? This screen is something up with this screen. It's not showing the, first, the top part of it. So my ID is Pierre Charles Lafont, but I'm bringing him in so I can talk about this, the District of Columbia. Because this is a very important development in our, I want you to know the history of the District of Columbia how it came to be, etc. So, in the earliest period of our national government, we met in New York City. Uh, George Washington takes the oath of office uh, right there by Wall Street, really, right down there in the heart of Manhattan. And Jefferson is complaining about various things. Hamilton, uh, th there begins to be talk about the need for a, uh, the national government actually having land that it controls. And my understanding is that the, uh, well, uh, during one event in New York City, the Federalists were considering a law which a lot of the people of the city didn't like. 
because they were more average people. And that they came to where the legislature was meeting, broke into where the legislators were, and began to come in and yell at them, right? So can you imagine if you guys are the legislature and the angry mob comes in and you are about to vote on something and they come in and start pushing your papers. They intimidated the, con the Congress and said, don't vote for this law. Well, now they started thinking, we've got to get this Congress that's going to make decisions out of any populace and put them by themselves where they can make decisions without being under duress of the local crowd. Where are we going to put this thing? Well, when Jefferson, sorry, when uh, Hamilton wanted this national bank, Jefferson finally relented, but he said, okay, but in, in return, I want this national seat of power to be brought way south from where it is now. And so what happens is they agree to create this thing, a piece of property ceded, land being ceded from Maryland and from Virginia. And they map this thing out in, I guess it would be a diamond. So the District of Columbia is land ceded from Maryland and from Virginia. And it is going to be controlled by the national government. It's there. They are not under the jurisdiction of any state. They're under just jurisdiction of themselves. They are that power there. It's not very big. It is, let me say this too, the Potomac River runs along right through the middle of it. They never use the southern side of it. And it mostly, almost entirely, the seat of power ends up in the, on the Maryland side. And so eventually they give this back to Virginia and they don't even bother to use it. And there was a little town here already existent. It was called Georgetown. Um, there was farm fields around there, and this area where the, the capital will become was basically a large, empty field. It's kind of marshy. wasn't used for much. Now, the, na the Congress decides that they need a plan for the city. We're going to have a national city. We need a plan for it. And so they decide to hold a contest where they will get different ideas about, and they can choose from among them. The one who wins, the person who's designed for the city that the Congress accepts is this guy, Pierre Charles Alfont. So now I've got to tell you more about him. He is a Frenchman. Go figure. Would you figure that out? <laughs> Pierre Charles Alfont. He, like um, Lafayette, came to America because he wanted to be part of this new place of liberty. He joined General Washington's forces. He's an architect by training. How about that? And he joins the war. They're like, I guess he shows up and they're like, I'm here to fight. You're like, what do you do? He goes, I'm an architect. They're like, awesome. <laughs> and so they get him to design battlefield uh, implements like um, redoubts and barricades and things like that for the battlefield. Corps of Engineers, I think we'd call them today. After the war, he sticks around and lives in America and becomes an architect, and he lays out the design for the city. And it's, really, it's great what he ends up doing. Um, if you look up here at this plan, I wonder if I, get, if I click a button, if I'm going to have a bigger picture of that. Yeah, there it is. Um, he calls for there to be a heart of the city. It's going to be zero, zero. And that is going to be what national, what building will be at the heart of the city? You got a couple choices. Could be the Supreme Court. What is it? Could be the White House. Could be the Capitol. Which one is it? It is the Capitol. Because if you look at the, dec the Constitution, it says, we the people of the United States. Who's the sovereign of all? It's the people. So it's got to be the legislature has got to be the, the heart of the city. He does have the idea that there should be a national, a, a house for the president where he operates, he so far, he uh, will operate uh, a department, also have executive buildings around him. And then he also wants the city itself to have a certain design. And so these, as far as north and south goes, it's kind of boring. Um, it's 
numbers going, no, it's numbers going east and west, and it's letters going up. I used to live at 31st and N Street over here. I guess about right over there. Um, but these big boulevards, does anybody can name for me a big road that they've been on in Washington? Pennsylvania Avenue. Guess what else there is? Connecticut Avenue. Massachusetts Avenue. All the big boulevards are named for the original state, colonies and states. And so Pennsylvania Avenue is the one that goes from the Capitol up to the White House. You all wonder where the Supreme Court is. Right now it's in the basement of the Senate. But um, also he comes up with a plan. He knows that there's two chambers, two bodies. Uh, one's going to be the, I'm trying to think which one I'm looking here. That's the White House. Of, I don't know. I can't tell. Anyway, that would be the Senate. And that would be the House of Representatives if, if the White House is over here. He also has the idea of eventually bringing them all under one roof line with a, a dome in the middle. And this becomes a plan for Washington, D.C. Did he design the Capitol? Or no? Not, I don't think he designed. He might have designed some of this early work, but I don't. Maybe he talked about this rotunda. Now, they replaced it during Abraham Lincoln's time, right, with a really grand, glorious marble structure, which it was being, they had to postpone it for a while. They were also building the, the uh, Washington Monument, I think, was being built in, too. Okay, so let me mention this. So, obviously, we're going to uh, pay homage to now President Washington, who's leaving. We're going to call it the City of Washington. And we're going to call it the District of Columbia. And Columbia, Lady Columbia, becomes the embodiment of the American civilization about what we're trying to achieve. Back then, they liked allegory, they liked allegorical um, or like, like metaphors. But we eventually get Lady Columbia. And if you've ever seen uh, Manifest Destiny, that painting with that female figure going into the West, that's Lady Columbia. Later on, we decide we need a male embodiment for our more masculine things in certain times. What do, we, what do we use for our allegorical figure then? Before we go to war, Uncle Sam. You already said it. Very good. A lot of people don't know. We've kind of gotten rid of Uncle Sam and Lady Columbia. We don't talk in those terms. All right. So, uh, by the way, last thing is if you're ever in D.C. and you stop at a uh, metro station right here, it's called La Font. You'll know why it's called L'Enfant. L'Enfant. All right. Now, with Washington having stepped down and refusing to run again to the sh irritation of Adams, I'm sorry, Hamilton, it's time for uh, our first contested election. Washington wasn't contested. He was unanimously voted on. But now, uh, by the way, uh, John Adams, important for Declaration of Independence and other things, well-regarded man from Massachusetts, has been serving as vice president. And Jefferson challenges him for the presidency. And it is a bitter challenge to the presidency. Where do I have it? I'll probably bring it back here in a second. Um, President, uh, let me just say this. Adam, this is your 12th Amendment coming up here as an ID, the 12th Amendment. And it's, and it's, the 12th Amendment has to do with the election. The election results are Adams comes in first and Jefferson comes in second. But according to the way the Constitution was written, when it was written, it said, whoever comes in first in electoral college is president, whoever comes in second is vice president. So these two men that were running against each other are now president and vice president. How would you like it if it was Trump and Clinton? <laughs> would that work very well in a cabinet meeting, among other things? And so they realize they've got a problem immediately. And say, so like, gee, how do we fix this? We cannot have two people. Because they really weren't anticipating parties. And they weren't anticipating us hating on each other the way we did. So here's, here's the 12th Amendment says this. When you get to the Electoral College, they're going to do one. Everybody votes once on the president. Okay, that's the president. And then they vote a second time. 
for the for the vice president. So now the whoever is clearly the lead and is going to become president can have somebody who is going to be elected to go along with them. And, and this president has let them know who they want them to vote for so that we get a team managing the presidency. Now, we're not going to do well during this first 25 years of our republic. And the thing that just about ends us as a country is this wrangling between each other. And I'd like you to know that, they, that one of the things that bothers us is the French Revolution is underway. The, I think the same year that our Constitution goes into effect, 1789, the French overthrow their king, ultimately. And the French Revolution starts off in a way that Americans like and admire because they're moving, actually, we're moving towards a constitutional monarchy. But then the, they, we like the, uh, this, this Declaration of the Rights of Man. It's all based on the U.S. Con, uh, Bill of Rights concepts, liberty. All that's great. But then the revolution gets radicalized when the king tries to escape to return with the aristocrats and stop the revolution. That leads a man named Robespierre coming to power in the French Revolution and this thing called the Reign of Terror, where 16,000 suspected uh, enemies of the revolution go to their death on a guillotine. And it's looking like the have-nots. Remember the have-nots? Remember Shays' Rebellion? Remember the Whiskey Rebellion? American property people are worried about the have-nots. Aren't they greatly outnumbered in America as far as democracy goes? And Federalists begin to fear that pol popular politics relying on the people and political leaders making appeals to the leader, appeals to the people, can end up with demagogues. And so the Federalists begin to look at the French Revolution as a bad thing. And they want to say, if you're an American who speaks favorably of the French Revolution, well, then that tells us something about you. And so Jefferson was still supportive of the French Revolution. And he said, the reason it's gone to these excesses is because of what the French people are having to do to get their liberty. So it was the first time that our attitude as, as Americans towards a, what's going on in a foreign country ends up dividing us. And that still remains today. What's your attitude towards Cuba? Should we allow Americans to go there? Should we break our blockade that we've had on them for 50 years? Or should we keep the blockade up? And that will come into our own domestic politics. And the very first time that happened was the French Revolution. Now, let's get on to another ID. The Federalists are still in the driver's seat. They've, still, they've got the presidency, and they've got the majority of the senators, and they've got a lot of power in the Congress. But Republicans, in order to appeal to the public to vote for us next time, our newspaper journalists begin to go on the attack. They attack Adams in ways that they would never have attacked Washington. They get personal. They go National Enquirer on the guy, right? They start, they talk about everything from his breath to the fact that he's trying to in, import prostitutes for, his, for himself from Russia. Uh, what else? I can't remember. He, he's trying to get his son married to the King of England's daughter to set up a monarchy. They start attacking other Federalists in power in the press. Now, the Republican writers, they say, we're, we're opposed to the government in power. Yes, we are. But we're still loyal to the government, loyal to the country. Just because we're complaining about the government doesn't mean we're not loyal to the country. Don't accuse us of treason. But the Federalists in power, they think that what the Republicans are doing in the press is wrong. And so they pass two acts, the Sedition Act and the Alien Act. Both of these are rich 
with portent for the future. And, they, and we can go ahead and split them. Let's just kind of talk about the Sedition Act first. The Sedition Act makes it illegal to undermine, to write about a federal, uh, a federal office holder, be it somebody in the legislature or be it someone in the executive branch, to write in su- about that person who holds office in such a way to undermine that person and the office he holds. They're saying when you're attacking this man who holds his position, you're attacking the office and we can't let you attack the office. And if you do so, you'll go to jail. Now, let me ask you a question. Who enforces federal laws? The, the federal government, right? And so do you know which, um, within the cabinet, which position is responsible for that? We've got Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State, Secretary of War. Who is over the administration? Did you already say it? Somebody? Did you do it, Rachel? The Attorney General. The Attorney General in the the Department of Justice, right? So this Sedition Act gives the power to the Justice Department under the Attorney General to prosecute people in states who are going to, who criticize an office holder. The Republicans are going to go nuts over this law. Why are they going to go nuts over this law? It's unconstitutional based on what? <laughs> the very First Amendment. They're like, hello, can you read this? It says, Congress shall make no law infringing upon the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press. And here you've just made that. Strict construction, I'd say, on that one. And the Federalists say, well, you can't say just anything. It's an implied issue here that we're not going to let you say anything. And that sedition, a sedition, by the way, it comes to us out of the military. It's when a, maybe a, uh, a regular soldier whose um, captain has told them they're going to go do this thing, and you say to him, that's a crazy idea. We're all going to get killed. That is sedition. And you can find yourself in trouble for that. So this is, this idea of sedition is that you're undermining authority by what you're doing. The other one is the Alien Act. There's been several UFO sightings. And the, no, not really, okay. (laughs) This is what I'm going to call people who are moving here from abroad. They're aliens. They don't look like aliens, but trust me, they're aliens. (laughs) The Federalists have got a problem on their hands. Federalists tend to be men of property, affluent commercial types. People who are moving here tend to be coming without much money. And their dream to come into America is so that they can do what? Become maybe not rich, but that's later. They want they just want land, right? Most of them anticipate becoming farmers. Which party do you think they're gonna join? The Federalist Party, the wealthy commercial class, or more like the Jeffersonians, the yeoman farmers, right? And so here's the problem with the Federalists. They look at the map, they're like, yeah, we've got the map right now. Up here in New England, there's a lot of us in the cities, but as we spread westward, we're gonna be more and more farmers, and all these new people coming here are farmers, and they're gonna vote for the opposition. So what can we do? We gotta figure out a way for them not to vote. And that's another long-term tradition in America. So the Alien Act does this. Any person moving to America cannot vote in federal elections for 14 years. What happens in the state where you move to, that's up to the state where you move to. If they let you vote tomorrow, you can vote tomorrow. But for federal elections, you can't vote for 14 years. And just to further complicate it, Two years prior to you being eligible to vote, you've got to fill out paperwork. And if you don't get that paperwork filled out and you show up at the poll to vote and they tell you you were supposed to sign a paperwork two years ago and you're like, I didn't know that, it starts over. 
I don't know if it's a whole 14 years, but you got to wait two more years. And then you got to remember the right time. You got to go, you got to sign up the paperwork and then come back to your senator to vote. It's all about trying to make sure that people that don't vote for you don't vote. Another long term tradition in America. They're figuring this stuff out early. The Republicans are incensed by both of these things the Democratic Republicans of Jeffersonians. What can you do about it? States' rights. This is when the Democratic Republican Party becomes about states' rights versus federal power. And they say the federal government might pass these laws, but we states have got rights too. <laughs> and the most amazing thing happens, and this is a real contest within the federal and state power in the early part of a republic. Virginia, and I only give you the Kentucky resolutions, the, the Virginia legislature and the Kentucky le legislature, and I think it was the Kentucky one first, a new state on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, passes a resolution saying this, the Alien, and, well, the Alien Act, they don't, the Sedition Act will not be enforced in the state of Kentucky. I don't think both acts because they really can't. Yeah, they probably could because they, since they're handling elections, they probably could say, we're going to let people vote for federal offices. We don't you know, care. But especially the Sedition Act. You cannot enforce this law in the state of Kentucky because we think it's unconstitutional. It's clear that it's unconstitutional, they say. Well, Y'all need to think, I want to really concentrate your minds on this. What they're saying is the Department of Justice, through a district attorney, cannot come and arrest a man in Louisville, a, report, a newspaper, and say that you have broken the Sedition Act. You, if you try to get him and take him to a courtroom, a federal court, well, you can't do it. We're not going to let you enforce that law in our state. This is a huge attack on the authority of the federal government. And Virginia is saying the same thing. You want to arrest a newspaper person in Richmond? You want to send in, uh, what would that be, a marshal? I don't even know what it would be. Then. Who would apprehend someone that a district attorney has brought, if I'm even saying the right, a federal attorney has brought uh, some, a complaint against. Actually, it could be today. I'm talking about. Yes. It could be any law enforcement officer. State or. Execute the writ, but normally a federal marshal, U.S. marshal. Okay. Deputy U.S. marshal. And what Virginia is saying is, you cannot. If you you try to go arrest him and take him to court, we're going to stop you. What does that look like, even? That means state authorities are stopping federal authorities from carrying out the law. Now, what Hamilton obviously realizes is, and so does Adams, this is a huge attack on the whole concept of a federal government and federal power. And it's got to go answered. Because if this kind of thinking goes forward, federal laws are really just suggestions. And they're not binding on the people or on the states. Here's what I, I like you know that Hamilton recommends that Adams go Washington on them, call up the militia, put on the mantle of <laughs> Commander-in-Chief and march on Kentucky. Occupy Louisville until they rescind that law and take it away and subject to, submit to federal authority. And Adams says, I don't think I'm going to do that, <laughs> which was the wisest thing that Adams ever did. Can you imagine, would he get the militia of Virginia to, to agree to do that? Probably wouldn't get, get Pennsylvania to agree to it. Maybe not even New York. Maybe Connecticut. Maybe Massachusetts. But then you've got to march those militias down through Pennsylvania and Virginia. You think they're going to allow them to go through? What do you have on your hands? A civil war immediately. And the Union would have been over. And I don't think Washington would have even been dead. To, he would have already, he'd already been come apart before he got a chance to die. <laughs> Hope for the best. So Adam says, let's wait till the next election is over and see what happens. Let's wait this out. <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> no, I, I want to finish this. You know what our problem is? We don't have a final decider. 
the two sides, one side is saying it's unconstitutional. And the other side is saying, yes, it is constitutional. You can't do just whatever you want to. Oops. We're going to get the, our solution to our problem here in just a minute. Something we very much needed. A final decider. A referee. Well, seems I'm missing four. Maybe I'm not there. Oh, I know what I'm. I, I know how I wrote that. Do we have any justices at this time? We have a we have a federal justice. And good for you. You're thinking about where who would be our decider, and I believe I need Jefferson. Oops, ah, I'm really messing this up. Jefferson. Gee whiz, that's sure I don't have a Jackson democracy. No, that's not right. Sorry, guys. Hold on one moment. Did I throw it away somehow? Civil War. Old South. <laughs> TJ Residency. <laughs> this is called the Revolution of 1800. It is the election of 1800. Because for the first time, the party in power becomes the party out of power. And the party out of power takes over the government. I, it's an amazing moment for any democracy when the group in power has to give up power to another side of it. I, in fact, on this essay, I, I, I say something to you guys. I say, tell me about how the party out of power responds to the party in power policies that it, they don't like. One of them was a whiskey rebellion. Another one was um, the Kentucky and, and Virginia resolutions. And then now this party is going to switch and they're going to become the party in power. But that says the revolution of 1800 up there. Jefferson, oh, I didn't mention this to you guys about the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Guess what mind was behind that? Hey, uh, well, Jefferson, <laughs> the vice president, the president's vice president, who, by the way, never bothered being Washington because he couldn't stand Adams. He is the one who's undermining the federal government as vice president. So here's a neat thing I'd like you to see. For the first time, we inject religion into political contests. Vote for me. I'm the man who is devout to God. Don't vote for the other guy. He's a godless atheist. Um, the grand, this is an advertisement from the period. It kind of comes across funny, but it's, a ad, it's an ad, political ad. The grand question stated, At the present solemn and momentous epoch, the only question to be asked by every American laying his hand upon his heart is, Shall I continue in allegiance to God and a religious president, or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God? <laughs> If you are somebody who believes in God, you should vote for Adams. If you don't, if you're an atheist and you want to go to hell, you go right ahead and vote for Jefferson. Pretty awesome. And we wonder when this all started. Some people said it was the most, well, let me open this for you. Somebody did something fun with it. What was that? It seems like every other thing we are talking about is happening today. <laughs> Nothing new, which gives me hope. <laughs> uh, this hyperlink right there, I want to grab. Why is it, I'm having so much difficulty with it? This thing hates me. I can do it this way now. So this is something kind of fun that somebody did. I guess um, let me set this up for you. 
You know how campaign ads work today and you take the other side? What they decided to do is they took the words from the actual election of 1800, what was said about the other ones, but they do it in a modern ad. What you'll see over and over is the Jeffersonians. They're, by the way, both groups play fear. Why do you, why do you want to use fear to try to get votes? It's, it's a motivating factor, right? It works. It works. It works more than anything. People will get off their butt and get, go into the polling stations if they're afraid that if they don't get in there, the other side's going to win. Well, let's see if you can follow it. I'll see if I can put some closed captions on. And I better turn this up. of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, it can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like the, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative election candidates have taken dirty to a whole new... It can life. seem like a return to... <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of fun. How do you like that? Those are some personal attacks, aren't they? Vote for Jefferson, and everything is going to hell. <laughs> wow. So, that, I tell you, it's a funny thing to say, but it gives me some hope. Because sometimes we watch party politics today, and by the way, I'm a registered independent and have been for years. And I don't like political alliances to a party because I know what parties can become. And I don't like it that America gets divided like the way they do, because it doesn't necessarily good for, I'm all about policy, and I would like to see good policy come forward. Um, and, oh, as a historian, have, um, has it been as partisan as it is now? Yes, clearly it has been. Okay. In fact, you'll see all through the early period, I mean, we don't do well. We are going to accuse each other of things throughout the time. And one of the ways to do it is to discredit the other side and say, how can you dare vote for them because they believe in this? Was Congress passing legislation? Yeah, they, that's true. They were. They were passing laws that the Federalists wanted, and now the Republicans are going, going to take power. Yeah, so yeah, you didn't have the gridlock, I suppose. I don't know uh, to what degree. They're getting the Judiciary Act passed and things like that. Let me go ahead and tell you real quickly what happens here because some interesting things happen. Um, a real political contest. The election pits these two, and Jefferson is clearly going to win. And he, gets, he wins more states than Adams does. And he's got a running mate, and he's an ID for you. His running mate is a guy named Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is from New York. And he's been a political activist on the side of the Jeffersonian camp. And they've entered into an alliance, basically, so that him, as somebody who lives up in the North, can help uh, rally people in the North behind Jefferson rather than splitting between the two of them, the vote. They need to get coordinated here. When they go to the, uh, the Electoral College to vote, 
Aaron Burr's people start trying to finagle it to get some people who were supposed to vote for, who came from the states of Jefferson, let's vote for Burr. Burr's people make a play to make Burr president by getting people to vote for him on the first vote. <laughs> Burr's a despicable character. <laughs> he goes on to do more. The way they screw this up is that Jefferson and Burr tie in the Electoral College on that vote for president. What happens if there's a tie in the Electoral College? goes to the House of Representatives. Guess what? The House of Representatives that's in session is the one dominated by the Federalists. The new session to come in where the Republicans will take charge won't be installed until March. They're like, oh my God. The existing legislature made up of Federalists get to choose the president. We choose Adams. <laughs> is what they want to do. They, that's their good point. The uh, Republicans cry foul and they say, don't you dare try to install Je uh, Adams as president when it's quite clear that the whole country wants Jefferson and maybe even Burr over him. And they say there'll be blood in the streets. It'll be the end of the union if you guys do this. So, is this going to be the House of Representatives that chooses between these two? And it really comes down to Hamilton. Hamilton says, as bad as Jefferson is, as worried as I am about him becoming President of the United States, he might destroy our, you know, the power of the federal government. Aaron Burr cannot be trusted with power. There's something wrong with this guy. He can't have the presidency. And so, the Federalists, ironically, vote for Jefferson and Jefferson becomes president. There's a lot of firsts that happen here. He's the first president to win a contested election after people have said really horrible things to each other. And he's the first president that says, reaches across the aisle and seeks conciliation. Conciliation is to be after a really hard fought battle, maybe on the basketball court or whatever, afterwards we're like, don't forget we're all Americans, let's work together. He's the first one that gets a speech like that. He goes out of his way to try to show Americans what a president should look like. He refuses to wear, uh, he wears a plain, a much more the clothes of a plain man. He refuses to wear slippers, I think it is, or buckles, I can't remember which one he won't agree to. He insists on staying in a common, um, public house in Washington, D.C. the night before. He insists on walking to the inauguration and not going in some big carriage like Washington and Adams had done. And when he takes the White House, he's known to even answer the door himself in a house robe <laughs> and saying, may I help you? And they're like, yes, we're looking for the president. You found him. May I help you? You have a drink. No, I'm playing. He was just this man of the people, and he wanted to do that. He also tries to scale back. Um, I wonder if I've got time to do, yes, I'm going to try, to, I really wanted to get here tonight. Mad Marbury versus Madison is a really important development, and I'll see if I can pull it off here. It's going to give us a final referee, a final decider over matters of constitutionality. And I have to tell you, it's a little complicated. My apologies up front. As the Federalists are leaving town, when they know they've lost the election in November of 1800, and that in March 1801, the Republicans are coming to Washington to take it, they decide to try to pass a law that will safeguard their power over the judiciary. They create the Judiciary Act of 1801, which creates these new district courts. It also creates a justice of the peace for Washington, D.C. And they want these things made now so that they can get Federalists in there who will be there for as long as they want to be. It'll give them control of that branch of government. Now, they are passing legislation like crazy, trying to get it all done before the stroke of midnight on like March 12th, before their power goes away. 
So we call these things midnight appointments, these very last things you're trying to get done. So what has to happen is the president has to nominate someone for a position. It goes over to the Senate. The Senate then uh, votes on it. It comes back to the president. The president gives the signed and now sealed document to the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State has got to go find that person, give it to him, all before the stroke of 12 on a certain night. Now, Mr. Marbury had had his appointment was going to be Justice of the Peace for Washington, D.C. And he had this midnight appointment. I have to tell you that the Federalists anticipated that there could be some kind of problem here. So what they actually wrote into the Judiciary Act is they compelled whoever the next Secretary of State is that he has to carry out this function. We, this Senate, has named this person and ratified it, and whoever the next Secretary of State is has got to carry this thing out. Mr. Madison, James Madison, who, oh, by the way, has switched sides. He used to be all about federal power, but now he's worried about it, and he's on the side of Jefferson. Jefferson names James Madison Secretary of State. It is the Secretary of State who hands out these authorizations. Mr. Madison, after the inauguration, goes to the office of the Secretary of State, finds Mr. Marbury's signed, sealed document, and he throws it in the fire. And I don't think so. Because the Republicans have cried foul. They've said that you guys are making these decisions when you're leaving. The people have spoken. They don't want you to make any more acts. In fact, we begin to call this a lame duck session. So here's what I want you to know. Mr. Marbury, who was a Federalist who was given this job, <laughs> the Secretary of State had already left town. The Secretary of State's name is none other than, James, uh, than uh, Marshall, John Marshall. He had been named Supreme Court Justice. He'd left town. <laughs> Marbury sues Madison for failing to perform the duties that he is that the Congress has told him to do in the Judiciary Act of 1801. So here's the, the huge irony of this thing. Marbury's a Federalist, and now he goes before the Supreme Court. And he says, well, Mr. Justice here, uh, and by the way, you've got an ID on your list called James John Marshall. Did you all see him there? So John Marshall is going to be the, so the most important Supreme Court Justice for us in the early republic. There are nine Supreme Court justices, but there's also something called a chief justice who organizes the court and gets the calendar together and leads the court. So Marbury says, your honors, uh, I had all this done except that the Secretary of State, which, oh, by the way, is you, Mr. Marshall there, had left town and they didn't get this thing, but Mr. Madison should do this. And here's the big surprise. The Supreme Court decides in favor. Uh, the Supreme Court decides against Marbury. All right? You would think, since it's a group of Federalist judges, that they would have decided for Marbury and got him in the position. But they had a much bigger thing that they could do. Marshall says that certain aspects of the Judiciary Act of 1801 are unconstitutional. And what does he base it on? He says the legislative branch cannot compel the executive branch to do certain things. The executive branch has autonomy. And so for the legislature to say that the next uh, Secretary of State has got to perform this action, that's an, an infring infringement on the power and exclusive authority of the federal government. Now what he has done in this decision is created something called not due process, but uh, judicial review. This is a concept I want you to come out of this. Judicial review. Is it on there? Yay. Absolutely. It means that if there is a question of something being constitutional or not constitutional, we have someone who could decide it. The Supreme Court has now taken on this authority. It doesn't strike down the whole thing even. It even just says this section right here is unconstitutional, and therefore it will not go forward we finally have a decider. So, so for instance, remember the Sedition Act where the two sides were hating it 
and the Kentucky, the state of Kentucky said, we're not going to abide by this. If you think something's unconstitutional, guess what you do? You go to the Supreme Court for, or you go to the court system. Does it mean that every decision, every law has to go to the court for approval? Absolutely not. Laws roll out of the legislature. It, the, ju- the judicial system only comes in to weigh in on the matter of whether it's constitutional or not if it's challenged by Americans who say this is unconstitutional. And then it's got to work its way through the court system. And the Supreme Court becomes the, the highest court of the land. But I guess I will submit to you is this. This is what we need needed. We needed somebody who could, who could solve the issue and say, you know, I hear you're both sides, but this is it. And ever since then, even though Americans get upset, and most recently I think they were very upset about the 5-4 decision on uh, the, whether or not uh, uh, these marriages between same-sex couples that are taking place in different states, whether or not they are legal, and also whether or not other states that say you can't marry the same sex, whether sta- people in those states can get married. You remember that decision? What was it, 19, 2015, 16? Well, that was your little loss, but when the Supreme Court ruled on it, 5-4, yeah. that's supposed to, that's it, unless there is a federal amendment, right? That's the only way you can do it, because, so, we have done a good job in America of uh, letting the decision of the, the Supreme Court be the thing where we say, okay, it's decided, and we go on with life. We needed that. All right. See you guys next week. Well, actually, not going to see you all next week. <laughs> see you in two weeks. I'll give you a quiz over what I've presented tonight, between now and then. But nothing, no, I don't have any video lectures for you, so congratulations. Unless you're wanting to go back and look at the stuff after the fact, which I doubt many of you do. <laughs> Who's saying that? Is that Kara? Good for you.